Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tom Haig, I'm the Marketing Manager at DL uh, Wakefield. Firstly, I want to say again, thanks again for taking the time to join us today. I hope there's lots of useful information and topics for you to take care with you. Um, last year, some of you might remember, we did Full Circle virtually uh, because of the COVID pandemic. And we were hoping to host this Full Circle in Warsaw, uh, but that was cancelled because of the war in Ukraine. And then it was postponed again because of train strikes. So it kind of goes to show what kind of world we're living in and how quickly it can change. Um, and on that topic, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about carbon and coffee and climate change. Um, um, last year, we started our journey in carbon um, and set about measuring our carbon footprint. It was a journey that was filled with lessons and we quickly got an appreciation for the complexities of climate change and working with carbon and coffee. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about what we learnt. Um, I'll share you, with you uh, the data that we gathered on our journey in the hope that maybe some of you can use this in your journeys in carbon as well. Can I just see maybe like a show of hands? Is, is anyone working in carbon and coffee at the moment or do you have any plans on working in this area? The roasteries in the near future. Okay, a few of these. So, with any journey, I think it's good to understand why we're setting off. So, I'm going to start with some of the basics um, around climate change with three simple graphs. So, what is the problem with climate change? So, the problem is uh, atmospheric greenhouse gas levels. So, this has been rising steadily uh, since the 1800s. Um, Greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere are at their highest level for over 4 million years. Um, what these do is they wrap around the Earth, trap in heat and gradually rise the Earth's temperature. Um, they're rising at a rate which is the fastest that it's been in over 66 million years. So they're kind of entering some uncharted territory. Um, this graph here shows the atmospheric CO2 levels in the atmosphere. Um, and what does, what does this do? So, sorry, what does, what's the cause of this? So, rising greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere is directly linked to the burning of fossil fuels. Um, this has been rising as well since the pre-industrial revolution. Um, and today, around 80% of the energy that we use is still uh, related to the burning of fossil fuels. So, fossil fuel burning comes from coal, uh, oil, and gas. And this is used for many different things. Um, like powering buildings, powering transport, manufacturing goods, but also through agriculture. Um, livestock creates methane, which is a greenhouse gas, but also deforestation linked to agriculture releases carbon and reduces the Earth's capability to absorb carbon as well. The consequences of this, quite simply, is hotter temperatures. So this graph shows the global average temperature over time. Now, because the Earth is an ecosystem and changes in one area can influence changes in another, um, hotter temperatures also cause lots of different things going on in weather systems. Uh, there's more moisture in the air, so there's more flooding, there's more extreme rainfall, and uh, there's also more drought, so we get more des desertification and crop damage as well. We can see this playing out today, you know, this year, a third of Pakistan underwater and we all know how climate change is affecting coffee both in terms of markets but also our origin. We've noticed in our origin trips this year that hotter temperatures are causing immediate uh, impacts on coffee farms around the world. So for us collectively, you know, we're all here in this room because of coffee, um, what does hotter temperatures look like when it comes to coffee production? So this is a map um, which shows how coffee could be affected um, with hotter temperatures in the future. Now today, um, temperatures have risen by 1.2 degrees since pre-industrial levels. And the past decade has been the hottest on record. Um, in the future, by the end of the century, climate, climate scientists figure that the temperature rise could be anywhere between 1.6 degrees and over 4 degrees. Um, and recent studies have shown that in all cases, even if we 
limit global warming to 1.6 degrees, coffee does not fare very well, or Arabica coffee does not fare very well. And in fact, by 2050, around 50% of the current production lines for Arabica coffee will be halved. Um, this shows uh, the change in suitability for growing Arabica coffee across the world by 2050. Um, and four out of the five top producing countries, which is Colombia, Brazil, Indonesia, and Vietnam, will all see a significant decrease in suitability for growing Arabica. We will see other countries like the United States, Uruguay, Argentina, and China, who may see an increase in suitability, um, and, but we're not too sure what that might look like. Uh, certain other species of coffee will become more significant in the future, like Robusta, instead of filler, which Kew Gardens are doing some really interesting work around. But um, demand is also expected to increase by 25% by 2030. So with increasing demand and uh, reduction in volume, immediate action is needed really to protect coffee in the future. But what is the solution to this? What is the solution to climate change? Well, to look at the solutions, we have to look towards climate policy. Now, we've known about climate change for a long time. It was first discovered in 1896 by a Swedish scientist, but formal political action didn't really take place for another 90 odd years until 1972, with the first Earth Summit. Now, in the past half decade, there's been a lot of uh, conferences around climate change, but the main one for us is the introduction of the Conference of the Parties, or COP, in 1995. And there's been two main moments in the history of COP. The first one was the Kyoto Protocol at COP3 in 1997. This was the first greenhouse gas reductions treaty. Um, unfortunately, it didn't really materialize because the countries involved couldn't really get along or agree. Um, and nothing much happened until 2015 with the introduction of the Paris Agreement uh, at COP21. And the Paris Agreement was the first time really that the whole globe came together to collectively uh, decide to work on climate change um, as a collective really. And today, 193 countries have signed the Paris Agreement and in recent weeks we've seen how this has taken shape at COP27 in Egypt. Has anyone heard of the Paris Agreement? Just before I move on. Okay. So the Paris Agreement it has three main points when it comes to climate policy. Um, the first point is to enhance the resilience to climate change. So this is to build and adapt to the challenges of climate change. Another point is to help fund that adaptation. So within the policy or the agreement, uh, there needs to be a release of funds to, to people and organisations to be able to adapt to the, to the issues of climate change. This is where most of the uh, work and the progress was done at COP27 last week. But the other point which is key to us is the agreement ties in countries to limit the average global temperatures uh, increasing well below 2 degrees C or ideally to below 1.5 degrees C. And this is really important for us moving forward because it puts things into context when it comes to talking about carbon footprints. Now, back in 2015, when this was introduced, it was believed that we could achieve these targets by climate or carbon emission reductions or greenhouse gas emission reductions. But today, seven years later, reductions aren't alone enough and we have to look towards removal as well. And this is something which is known as net zero. So this is a global timeline um, which looks at warming projections over the next uh, 80 years. Now net zero is basically the same as uh, carbon neutral, but it applies to all greenhouse gas emissions rather than just uh, carbon dioxide. And to reach the climate Paris, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement targets, we need to be able to half the amount of greenhouse gas emissions being produced by 2030, and we need to reach net zero by 2050. Uh, current pledges and targets will give us an estimated uh, 
increase of about 2.4%, uh, which is not good news. So immediate action is needed by countries, by businesses, and by everyone really to, uh, to try and reach these targets laid down in the, the Paris Agreement. Now today, 80 countries have signed uh, net zero pledges and set net zero targets for themselves. And over a thousand cities, businesses around the world have also signed their net zero uh, targets. Now last year, we also wanted to join this uh, community and we set about calculating our carbon footprint um, to try and start that process. Now carbon footprint, is kind of the basic starting point for any journey to net zero. Um, without an understanding of what our current carbon emissions are as a business, it's really hard for us to know where we're going and how we're going to get there. Because net zero is a process that uses carbon reduction and offsetting to hit those net zero targets outlined in the Paris Agreement over a set period of time. Uh, this time frame for business can be anywhere between 5 and 15 years. Um, and it's usually done in keeping with something called science-based targets, which are developed by the Science-Based Target Initiative. And the Science-Based Target Initiative was developed uh, by an institution um, to tie in uh, offsetting and reduction goals in keeping with the Paris Agreement. So for us, the obvious starting point for a journey in net zero is to start off with our carbon footprint. Now, there's many ways to calculate a carbon footprint, um, but the most used method um, and the most applicable method for us is the greenhouse gas protocol. Has anyone heard of this before? Or is this okay? So, the greenhouse gas protocol is really good when it comes to a value chain like DR rainfalls. Um, we work with so many countries around the world, and we have so many customers around the world, that we needed something that included all of our value chain. And the Greenhouse Gas Protocol does that through these different scopes. So we have scope one, which is direct emissions. Now these are direct emissions which are directly related to our business activity. Um, this would include things like vehicles that we used on site, or any fossil fuel burning directly on site. For us, this is not a massive uh, significance because we're a service-based company with quite a small office space and a small team. Um, scope two is indirect emissions, which is more en energy related. So this is things like electricity, which isn't generating carbon emissions on site directly, but it is through the creation of this electricity and kind of power plants off site. So scope two is more indirect energy related emissions. Now scope three is all of the indirect emissions in our value chain. And this is where things get quite complex for us as a business because this is where the majority of our emissions lie. Now scope three emissions can be upstream and downstream. So for us as a business, upstream emissions basically is everything that happens to the coffee before it arrives in the warehouse. So this is cultivation, growing, harvesting, processing, transport, packaging, uh, shipping, everything that happens to the coffee is with the farm and the warehouse. And downstream is everything that happens to the coffee after we sold it to you guys. So roasting, transport to the roastery, grinding, packaging, consumption, the waste of the product. This is all included in our scope of three. So the reason the Greenhouse Gas Protocol is so effective is that it basically doesn't allow for any carbon emissions that the whole value chain chain to be forgotten. So for example, if you were doing your carbon emission calculations with this same Greenhouse Gas Protocol framework, our scope threes might over overlap, which means we're double counting the carbon created in both of them, in a shared value chain. Now it's designed like this so that don't have any carbon emissions that have fallen through the cracks and everything's accounted for. Now within scope three, there are 15 subcategories and this is where things get a little bit technical. So this is our whole carbon footprint broken down into the emissions, 
in tons of CO2 equivalent and the percentage of those emissions in relation to our whole value chain. Give you 20 seconds to just read through these. So what you'll see initially is that scope one and two are quite insignificant. So scope three is everything from purchase goods and services all the way down to investments at the bottom. Now for us, as I mentioned, we're quite a small team and our scope one and two emissions are quite significant. Um, I've got the figures here. So in total, our scope one emissions and scope two emissions combined is just 11 tons of CO2 equivalent. Now, CO2 equivalent is used as a, as a metric to uh, measure all the carbon gas emissions for our, um, for our value chain. So this takes any emissions that are created in this specific activity and translates it through to CO2 equivalent. It's like a solid metric that everything can be measured against. So all the measurements you'll see here are uh, presented in CO2 equivalent. Um, our scope 3 emissions has a total um, of 190 tonnes of CO2 equivalent. So this is 99.9% .9 of our emissions lie in scope 3. Now, it tends to be the case that scope 3 makes up about 80% of emissions for most businesses. So we expected this to be significant, but it was really surprising to us how significant in terms of our total value chain emissions scope 3 was. Um, we did this research in, keep in partnership with the Carbon Trust, um, who have over 20 years experience working with climate change. And the basic way in which we gathered this data was to look internally within our supply chain. Um, we gathered a year's worth of data from the 31st of January 2020 to the 1st of February 2021. And we passed on this data to Carbon Trust to then use that data alongside peer-reviewed research to calculate emissions based on uh, other data that was available. So what we do is figure out our volumes of coffee and you know, how many miles that coffee's travelled and then we gather data relating to transport and production and calculate carbon emissions that way. Within this data, um, there was 95 million kilos of coffee that passed through our value chain. Um, this covered 1,440 different contracts. Um, there was 30 different origins that we sourced coffee from. And this went over to over 200 destinations around the world, covering 7 million kilometers. So for us, the process wasn't quick. It was quite a um, laborious process, gathering all this data. But as it started to come in, we started to learn some really interesting things. Now, the first thing we learned, obviously, was that scope three is the most significant part of our value chain. Um, because scope one and two are so insignificant, um, they're not necessarily worth going into. So what we'll do is we'll focus on scope three and delve into some of the most interesting points there. So this is our scope three uh, breakdown by category. So there are 15 total categories within scope three, but this is where the most significant emissions were created. Um, so you see this top one is uh, use of sold products. So this is indirect emissions for us and it's 39.1% of the emissions in our uh, carbon footprint. Now, the use of category is the brewing and cons consumption of all the coffee that we sold downstream in our carbon emissions data. So anything that has been roasted and processed, this is what goes into uh, using that product and consuming that product. Now upstream, we have 1A, which is purchase goods and services. And this is around 55% of our emissions. Um, this is everything that goes into the product upstream. So the growing, the cultivation, the processing, the harvesting, and the packaging of the coffee. 
In between those two, we have the processing of sold products. This is 4.5%. And this is everything that goes into roasting, grinding, turning coffee into consumable products. And everything else, which is transportation, distribution, uh, assets, business travel, this is everything else that makes up around 1.6% of our uh, carbon emissions. Now, before we did this work, we expected that transportation and distribution would, would probably cause quite a high percentage of carbon emissions within our value chain. It's what other data told us, we kind of heard of the research being done where this was quite a significant part. But actually, looking at our data, this was not really the case. It only makes up about 1.25% of total emissions within our value chain. And if you look into this a little bit further, although it's not necessarily significant for us as a business, because like 1.25% is it's not massively significant, there are certain learnings that we can take away from this. Um, we can see here that we've got three main uh, methods of transport that we use within our supply chain. Uh, we have sea travel, we have land travel, and we have air travel. Now, Sea travel makes up the most distance within the coffee that we ship, which makes sense because we're using freights to ship coffee around the world. Uh, second to that, we've got uh, land travel, um, and then air travel with the least amount of miles travelled. But the amount of emissions created by these different transport methods within our carbon footprint didn't equate to the amount of miles travelled, and this brings up a really interesting point when it comes to carbon emissions data. So, with all our carbon emissions in our carbon footprint, we're using something called emissions factors to calculate the total emissions for that specific activity. Now, an emissions factor is created through data that is available to the carbon trust. Um, and it's assigned to a specific activity and to a specific volume of coffee. So for transport, we're looking at per tonne of coffee per kilometre travelled and the emissions created within that metric. Now, the secondary axis that we can see on here, which is the green line which goes up, shows the different emissions factor for each of these transport methods. And we can actually see that Shipping coffee by sea is actually quite a sustainable way of moving coffee around the world. It's got quite a low emissions factor at 0.019 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per tonne per kilometre <laughs> travelled. Whereas shipping coffee by land, this will be in that transport either at origin or in Europe and the UK. This is uh, seven times higher with um, 0.132 CO2 equivalent. And the air travel is 21 times higher um, with 1.134 CO2 equivalent, tons of CO2 equivalent. So what we're discovering within our data is that although coffee travels the most by sea, the most sustainable, that is actually the most sustainable way of shipping coffee around the world. And it also kind of brings up the question as to how sustainable is flying coffee around. Um, I don't know why, which coffees we do fly around the world. Maybe there's high competition, lots of coffees maybe travel around the world. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so we're learning data, like, from the data in the sense that, although this is not necessarily significant for us, but what the 1.25%, we can learn something from this in terms of how sustainable our shipping is moving forward. Likewise, we found similar learnings within the packaging used uh, within our supply chain. So, this shows the different um, percentages by weight and the percentages by emissions for the different types of packaging in the coffee that we sourced within that year. Now, the majority of the coffee that we buy is in jute. So, this is uh, standard Hesse and Sachs. Following that, we have PE plastic and jute which is Grape Pro and Hessian. And then we've got plastic and aluminium foil, which is vacuum-packed bags. 
and then polyester, which is poly bags. And then the remaining percentage is a combination of eco tag bags or paper uh, or wood. Now, the packaging weight um, due makes up the majority of emissions. But on the second uh, pie chart, you can see how PE plastic and due, plastic and aluminium and polyester, make up more emissions um, than their fair share by weight. In fact, um, Polyester makes up 4% of volume, but it makes up 13% of our emissions. And plastic and aluminium foil makes up 3% of volume, but quite remarkable 17% of emissions within our value chain. Now again, the learning here is that different methods of packaging have different emissions factors, which is shown on this graph to the left. So we can see that plastic and aluminium foil has a much higher emissions factor per kilo, um, in terms of kilos of CO2 equivalent produced than, say, PE plastic and tube or tube together. And polyester has quite a high one as well as PVC plastic. So even though packaging only makes up 0.005% of our total value chain emissions, it's also interesting learning to see where we can make sustainable choices within our packaging as well. I think within our data, there was 90,000 kilos of packaging in the coffee that we sourced that year. So even though this isn't a significant part of our carbon value uh, emissions, it's really important to know this so we can make this uh, distinction moving forward. So processing use end of life. So again, just like we thought transport would, would be in quite a big part of our carbon footprint, the processing use of an end of life, which are the different uh, categories in our downstream emissions, really told us some interesting data. Now, we imagined that the processing of coffee, the roasting, the grinding, the preparing for the customer, would be the most significant part of this, uh, of this process, this downstream section of our carbon footprint. But in fact, this wasn't the case. It was the Category 11B, which is the use of stage, had significant more emissions than the, um, the processing stage. Now, the reason for this is because of the, uh, the use of additional products within this stage. So within this data, this scope three category, we're not only considering coffee, but we're considering milk and sugar and the takeaway cups and everything that goes into the pan. So within our carbon value chain, we actually have the emissions created with all sub-products that go into coffee as well. And this is why the processing, um, sorry, the use of that is, is such a high percentage in this downstream uh, section of our, our carbon footprint. One thing we did learn, which was interesting, was within this processing stage, um, we have different ways of processing coffee and manuf manufacturing coffee. And with normal roasted coffee, we have 0.76 kilos of CO2 equivalent per kilo of green coffee emissions created. But with uh, freeze-dried instant coffee, this was 19 times more higher per kilo, at 14.81 CO2 equivalent, which is quite a significant leap. Um, so that was an interesting bit of learning. But again, this stage was quite insignificant for us in terms of our uh, value chain. But another interesting thing about this is the most um, carbon emissions created here was in the use of phase. And if we were to use those science based targets, um, the framework around the science based targets to create a net zero pathway, this phase would actually be emitted from those goals. So this data is actually taken aside if we are to set net zero pathway for ourselves. Now this is interesting because it leads us on to our next point, which is the most emissions that were created in our uh, carbon footprint came from category 1A, which is purchase goods and services. Now with the use of phase included, this accounted for about 55% uh, of our total carbon footprint. 
Um, if we took that out, this would climb up to about 90% of our total carbon footprint. So for us, being 90% of the carbon emissions based on the greenhouse gas protocol framework with the science-based targets initiative, it was clear to us as a business that this was where our focus needed to be if we were going to produce and offset emissions moving forward. Now, as we start to look into these, this data, it quickly became quite interesting because um, the data itself is based on a few assumptions. Now, you'll see some interesting things in this graph. So this graph shows the carbon emissions created through regular coffee, which is non-caffeinated regular coffee, which are the blue bars, and the carbon emissions created through decaf coffee, uh, which are the yellow bars, and then the volume of coffee ports in kilos. Now you can see Canada is on here as an origin. Um, this is where Swiss water uh, decaf is. So all of our, or most of our uh, decaf coffee is processed through Canada, so it's included on there as an origin. Now interestingly, you can see that the volume of coffee bought from Canada and the emissions created from that volume are quite disproportionate in terms of um, <coughs> versus emissions. Now the reason being for this is again down to that emissions factor. And just like the instant coffee in the processing stage has a higher emissions factor per kilo of coffee than regular coffee, processing the decaf coffee has a higher emissions against regular coffee as well. Um, however, if you look at some of the other origins within here, you can see that same discrepancy. So if you look at India, for example, India made up 6.1% of volume but is the third largest contributor of emissions at around 12%. Indonesia has 4.3% volume, but has an emissions percentage of about 9%. And Brazil, conversely, has 28% of volume, but has only 16.35% of emissions. Now, we were left wondering, why is this? Why do some origins have such a high proportion of emissions compared to the volume of coffee poor? And again, the answer came down to the emissions factor. Now, if we were to calculate emissions factors for coffee at origin, we'll be incorporating quite a few different things. So in the growing of the coffee, we have fertilizers, pesticides, electricity, land use change that can create emissions. We also have carbon sequestration, which is the land's and the plant's ability to absorb carbon which offsets emissions slightly. But down that uh, origin value chain, we have fossil fuels, electricity, water, gas, employees that are involved in the processing of the coffee, and the transport, and the creation of fossil fuels that transport creates to get that coffee to an FOB uh, stage. Now, in an ideal world, we'd have specific emissions factors for each coffee within our value chain. But the next best thing is looking, rather than specific coffees, which is very granular data, to look at origin-specific emissions factors. So what we did was we looked at each origin we were sourcing coffee from, and we gathered emissions factors for each of those origins based on the available data and the research that was available to the Carbon Trust to create the emissions factors based on the volume of coffee we bought from each origin. And I'll show you those now. And one thing you'll probably notice is that a lot of these origins share exactly the same emissions factor. Now this is where our data starts to get a little bit hazy. So again, these emissions factors are in kilos of CO2 equivalent per kilo of coffee. However, because there isn't actually that much data when it comes to uh, carbon emissions created at origin for coffee production, we've had to make some very broad assumptions when it comes to calculating the emissions created with the coffee we bought at specific origins. So within this data, a lot of the origins that we're working with share this 7.83 CO2 equivalent emissions factor. And this is used in absence of any specific origin emissions factor that we have available to us. The other origins here, you can see the decaffeinated coffee 
has a high emissions factor of 23.54, but also Indonesia and India have very high emissions factors as well, uh, 18.4 or 17.21. Whereas Brazil and Honduras are a little bit lower at 5.16 and 10.35. Now there's an issue with these emissions factors as well because when the data is available for each of these countries, it doesn't necessarily mean that these are co coffee specific. So the high emissions factors for Indonesia and India are actually general agricultural emissions factors, which take into account regional issues like deforestation. Now we, we know this isn't true for a lot of the coffees that we buy from these countries. In India we buy biodynamic coffees, in Indonesia, we buy coffee that supports reforestation. So for us, it kind of creates a problem with our carbon footprint data because having a blanket emissions factors for so many origins due to the lack of available data and assigning more general emissions factors to the data that we do have available, it actually means that this isn't reflective of our actual value chain. Um, and that is an issue. So, for example, within that year's data, 53% of the coffee we bought was certified. But the, the available resources that we have and the information we have on carbon emissions in coffee at origin don't make this distinction. So, conventional coffee and organic coffee is effectively the same when it comes to carbon emissions with the available data. Likewise, within, I had a little look at the different coffees that we bought within this period, and there's a huge amount of diversity and uniqueness within the range. We have different varieties, different species of coffee. We have huge amounts of different processing, like red honey, yellow honey, red honey, uh, black honey, aerobic, anaerobic, washed. And we also have coffee produced in different ways, like shade grown coffee, monocrop, um, and grown by different people, like uh, washing stations or cooperatives or estates or single farms. And effectively, what these emissions factors have done is just removed any nuance from within our supply chain when it comes to our carbon data, which effectively makes the DR Wakefield's supply chain the same as any other green importer. So what that means is that if we were to set a net zero pathway, would quickly drift off course because this data isn't reflective of the actual supply chain within which we work. Now, it doesn't mean to say that all of this work is lost. It's actually very useful to us because we've learned a lot of things along the way. But the next step for us is quite a big one. Um, we need to start filling in the gaps. Um, and in fact, we're not alone in our experiences. The recent carbon and coffee paper published by the SCA found exactly the same thing with the um, people interviewed for this paper working in coffee. They found that 80% of people working in carbon and coffee found that there was a lack of available information to make specifically scope three uh, reduction plans to meet net zero targets. So what we've noticed is that not only are we experiencing a lack of data and information regarding our scope 3 upstream supply chain, but the industry as a whole is experiencing this as well. And for us, you know, we kind of see this as an opportunity. So the next step for us is to start filling in the gaps, which is not a small step considering how much coffee we buy and from how many producers, um, but we're going to start to gather carbon emissions data from as many producers that we work with as possible so that we can supply not only our carbon data with more realistic and accurate uh, numbers but share this with the coffee industry as a whole. And there are some really interesting tools for this uh, that are already available. So the Calm, um, the Cool Farm tool, which is a platform that any farmer can use to calculate their carbon emissions on their farm. Um, will be a really useful tool for us moving forward as we start to gather this data. But there are already some interesting relationships that we have that are one step ahead of this. Now, Tetera Coffee 
is kind of an exemplar for sustainable coffee production. Um, and they've recently gained, gained carbon negative certification. And what this means is that their, base, their farm sequesters or absorbs more carbon than it emits. Now, the reason for this is because they're very proactive in the preservation of the land, uh, the reforestation projects that they have. They've planted over 600,000 native trees as part of this project. But they've also got a huge amount of coffee. 11.7 million coffee trees. Now this altogether stores 1.2 million tons of CO2 equivalent in the land, which offsets their production and actually gives each 60 kilo bag of coffee that we buy from Zotero a 69.75 CO2 equivalent sequestered carbon. So this is basically uh, effectively a carbon credit that's attached to each 60 kilo bag. Now, for us, as we understand our own data, we can lean into this amazing work being done by the Terra, and we can figure out what that line of coffee might look like for you in your roastery. So the Terra FOB bag of 60 kilos will come with a 69.75 kilos of CO2 equivalent sequestered. Looking at our research, if we ship that coffee from Brazil, into our warehouse in Tilbury and delivered it here in London, um, we would probably make around 8.46 kilos of CO2 for each 60 kilo bag. What that means for you is that when that bag arrives at your roastery, you've got 61.29 kilos of CO2 equivalent to do with, I think, what you, what you wish. So whether this is to um, use within your own carbon footprint emission calculations or maybe used to offset emissions. This is something we're chatting with the Terra about. Because the offset, offsetting of emissions and uh, carbon credits is quite a complex area in itself. But what this means is that we can use our work in a really positive and honest way to create a carbon transparent line of coffee that can help you guys out as well. Now unfortunately, the way the carbon world works because our research was done by the Carbon Trust here in the UK, and the research on the terrorist carbon footprint was done by another organization in Brazil, we can't link these two up and create a carbon neutral certified line. This would have to be done by an institution who researched the whole of that supply chain at quite a heavy cost. But what this does mean is that we can use this data in a proactive and positive way, and hopefully share some of these carbon sequestration credits with you guys as well. So, this leads us into our like, last, I was going to end the, the presentation there, but then recently we've been looking into carbon offsetting as a, um, as a means to offset our scope 1 and 2 emissions. Now, considering our one, scope 1 and 2 emissions are, are quite insignificant for our value chain, um, and we've already started to reduce these where we can. You know, we've moved over to more sustainable banks for our, our samples, and we've moved to hybrid vehicles in our EU operations. We can't really do much more when it comes to our scope one and two, so we start to look into how best to offset these emissions. And it brought up a lot of complexity. So carbon offsetting has been this, the, uh, the subject of quite a lot of criticism as of late. Um, mainly due to the, some of the greenwashing involved with, with the projects um, attached to them. Now the reason for this is, I think Mark kind of mentioned in, in the previous talk, is that carbon which has been burned through fossil fuels has been stored in the, in the ground for thousands of years and a lot of the offsetting projects um, that are used to offset these emissions are through nature-based projects like planting trees, which may be store carbon for hundreds of years rather than thousands of years, if they don't burn down, maybe because of climate change. But what that will do is over time, will still build up atmospheric levels of greenhouse gas emissions. So recently there's been a bit more of a move towards technological carbon offsetting, which is through like direct carbon capture, or even geological offsetting, which is injecting carbon back into the rocks. But right now, these are very costly and 
they're not really scalable. So we're looking at different carbon offsetting uh, initiatives that kind of help us avoid this problem. Um, but biological carbon offsetting is really the solution uh, that we're looking at at the moment due to these scalability and cost related issues. Also, a lot of the criticism around carbon offsetting comes through something called, which has been termed carbon colonialism. So, a lot of the offset projects I feel are disadvantaging indigenous peoples in certain areas of the world as their land is being taken away from them for these carbon offsets, which is obviously something that we want to avoid as well. So, we're looking at a few different avenues. Um, firstly, we're looking at UK based carbon projects. Um, offsetting through grassland, peatland, coastal lands within the UK is a really good way to uh, offset carbon but also create green spaces for people to enjoy in the UK and also it creates more jobs as well. Interestingly there are um, certified carbon credits as well which is an ethical and sustainable way of offsetting carbon. Um, I think Mark mentioned that there are organic carbon credits that you can use. There's also fair trade certified carbon credits. Um, I feel this is a very interesting way of looking at this because it, it not only gives producers access to the carbon market, which is quite a um, powerful mechanism at the moment, but it also uses the fair trade minimum and the premium price mechanisms to ensure that the producers developing those carbon projects are uh, fully um, reimbursed for their efforts as well. So it's a nice balance between ethical and sustainable carbon offsetting. There's also a really interesting project which is run by uh, Rabobank called ACOL. Um, they did a, a webinar a few weeks ago and this basically they are introducing agroforestry or coffee farms um, mainly within South America. So this is a way of regenerating coffee farms which improves coffee, improves uh, resilience of coffee for coffee producers, but it also creates carbon credits which is then sold on the carbon market and creates extra income for those producers themselves. At the time of the talk I think it was something like $20 per ton of carbon credit and the producer gets maybe 80% of that. So what this is effectively doing is, is turning coffee farms into carbon farms. And I think this is quite interesting because moving forward with climate change and the challenges that climate change brings, it's the producers who are going to be the most effective and the people who are going to be the quickest to be affected. So farm diversification and uh, income sustainability for these producers are going to be essential moving forward if we're going to have any chance of keeping coffee alive in the next few decades. And I'll leave you with a really interesting graph. So this is also a graph which is rising, like the global temperatures and the amount of greenhouse gas levels, but instead of showing something catastrophic, I think it shows something really exciting. So this is the price of carbon in the EU uh, at the moment. And it shows that the potential of carbon farming coffee farms can be a really powerful thing, I think, for coffee producers worldwide. Um, using carbon creating our coffee farms helps us offset our carbon in a sustainable way, which is maybe keeps the value within our existing supply chain. Um, it also helps regenerate the land. Um, biological um, regeneration has around 38% um, capabilities to meet the uh, targets outlined in the Paris Agreement. So there's a huge amount of potential there. Um, soil is actually the world's second largest carbon sink, but around 75% of the carbon that's stored there has been lost because of conventional farming. So we're actually seeing a lot of our producer relationships move into organic or regenerative farming, um, which is having a really profound impact on the carbon story. But also the price of carbon is going to only increase as more businesses look to offset and this is going to create huge amounts of potential for coffee producers and their income diversification as well. So yeah, so this is what we've learned 
Um, I hope it's been of use and this information will be available to all of our customers if you want to do any research into your own carbon footprints as well, or if you need any data about your upstream uh, emissions, feel free to reach out and let us know. And um, yeah, if you've got, if anyone's got any questions, we'll do our best to answer them. We are quite new to this, so uh, we're learning along the way, but um, I think it's important to have a conversation. So yeah, thank you very much.